Welcome, everyone. Before introducing today's speaker, Professor Yuri Tsivyan, I would like to invite you to join us next Wednesday, January 23rd, when the Chris Noon Lecture will be given by Soviet sport historian Robert Edelman, professor of history at the University of California, San Diego. His talk will explore who won the London Olympics, Soviet communism and the Olympic movement. Uh, with the Winter Olympic quickly approaching, Olympics quickly approaching and set up in Sochi, Russia, I think it, the topic sounds particularly intriguing. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Yuri Tsivyan, one of the most, if not the most, distinguished film and cultural historians of Russia. We are indeed fortunate to have Professor Tsivyan with us today. Yuri Gavrilovich Tsivyan studied film history in Riga, Latvia, and Moscow, and also studied semiotics under the guidance of Yuri Lotman, a prominent cultural scholar of Tartu University and the founder of Soviet structuralism and semiotics. There is, of course, of course no need to introduce Yuri Lotman to this audience. In collaboration with Lotman, Professor Tsivyan has written a book on film, uh, on film language entitled Dialogues with, with the Screen, published in Estonia, Tallinn in 1994. He is currently William Colvin Professor in the Department of Art History, Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, Department of Comparative Literature, Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. The very number of departments that I just mentioned hints at the scope of Yuri's research interests and the interdisciplinary nature of his work. But the list alone doesn't reflect the unique character of Yuri's scholarship. The author of over 100 publications uh, in 16 languages, Professor Tsivyan is credited with launching two new fields in the studies of film and culture, carparalistics and cinematrics. Is it correct? Okay. <laughs> Carparalistics compares different uses of gesture in theater, visual arts, literature, and film. Cinematrics uses digital tools to explore the art of film editing. His many publications include several books that have beca become classical classics in Russian studies. Lines of Resistance, Ziga Vertov and the Twenties, published in Italy in 2004. Ivan the Terrible, not only the actual czar, but the Eisenstein movie, of course. Uh, the uh, British Film Institute, 2002. Early Cinema in Russia and its Cultural Reception, uh, published first in 1994, paperback at the University of Chicago Press, 1998. And Silent Witnesses, Russian Films, 1908-1919, published also in London, British Film Institute, 1989. We are honored to have Yuri Tsivyan here today to speak on the topic Chaplin and the Russian avant-garde, the lore of fortuity in art. Please join me in welcoming Yuri to the University of Michigan. Thank you, Olga. No one could really live up to the expectations you raised with all those 40 publics. Everything is Just, true. Uh, uh, oh, Mm, no. No? Uh, yeah, by the way, uh, the, uh, I was in the comparative uh, department, but they kicked me out for inactivity. <laughs> 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 so I'm th in three now. <laughs> Otherwise, um, yes, and uh, uh, thank you for, uh, um, <coughs> thank you and Nicole and uh, Sasha uh, for inviting me here or getting me here uh, to uh, Ann Arbor, a place which uh, became known and even legendary in a sense uh, um, because of Omri Ronen's uh, three volumes um, uh, from 
is Gorada N from the city of N. Um, and uh, um, uh, it so happened that I was privileged to uh, write uh, an essay together um, uh, with uh, Omri Ronen uh, for the second volume of this book. So I'm part of the city. So if this work, if this talk works well, I want uh, you to consider this uh, dedicated to the memory of Omri Ronen. Okay, uh, so, um, but let me start with commenting. And are we low enough that every letter of it is seen from everywhere? Do, can you hear me well? So in this case, uh, let me comment on this title. This title uh, <coughs> consists of two parts, and I start with the uh, second part. Uh, the, 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 the second part of it, uh, uh, the law of Tutino, uh, is of course not mine, it's a co quotation. Um, uh, which comes from a book of 1927 by Viktor Shklovsky. And it is, in a sense, Shklovsky's uh, manifesto in a nutshell, or the Russian formulated manifesto uh, in a nutshell. The thing is that in 1926, uh, Russian formalist theorists and Shklovsky among them uh, were looking desperately for ways of uh, connecting changes in art and literature, because we are formalists. Uh, with uh, changes in life and society. Uh, because, of course, we live uh, in the country which is Marxist, and that's what everyone requires, uh, life and art. Uh, and uh, the aim and the task they set for themselves uh, was to do this, to connect these two things without falling into the trap of Marxist aesthetics, which claimed that changes in art were directly caused by changes of life in, uh, and <coughs> society from above. Uh, OK, uh, now, yes, there must be a connection between the two, Shklovsky argued. But this connection is not causal, but contingent. Yes, he said, art and literature do have to do something with life. But not because art reflects or echoes life, uh, but because Art uses life as its material. Life, Shklovsky claimed, interferes with art, with art. It does, but not from <coughs> above, but from <coughs> below, as, let us say, new materials would interfere with the sculptor's way of shaping it, setting new interesting tasks for the sculptor. <coughs> and. Uh, making the sculptor invent new interesting devices. That was the connection from below. OK, that, uh, this interference, Shklovsky wrote, was similar to the role of random mutations in Darwin's theory of the evolution of species. Hence, the slogan he formulated in 1926, from which the quotation comes, we theorists must study the laws of fortuity in art. Now, um, let me uh, comment then now on the first part of uh, this title. Uh, this talk is about Chaplin, but it's not so much about Cha Chaplin as about what other people made of him, about Chaplin's famous, uh, famous fame. Uh, one often hears. Uh, what made Chaplin's fame really universal was that both highbrows and simple people liked him and liked him alike. Now, this view is sentimental and wrong. Chaplin was a man of two fames, as we sometimes observe a person casting two shadows, not necessarily similar to each other or to the person that cast them. Fame number one was Chaplin's enormous success with regular film goers. Uh, this fame came to, take, came to him instantly. By 1915, and he started in 1914, uh, was uh, more or less, um, uh, everyone more or less uh, agreed as to who was the funniest film comedian in the world. Now, this was the kind of fame Chaplin couldn't understand and knew how to deal with, how to communicate with. Now, the other fame, uh, the fame I'll be dealing with here, uh, emerged later, between 1916 and 1919. 
Now, this was the time when Chaplin became a cult figure among young Europeans intellectual, playwrights, poets, and artists. Now, this fame originated in France from where it spread to Germany and Russia, changing its shape as it, ch as it changed these countries. Chaplin was aware of this fame. From time to time, someone would show him a strange picture of his Charlie or tell a weird story uh, read about Charlie. Uh, and the more he learned, uh, the more he felt puzzled. And once he even asked, asked Sergei Eisenstein for help. Now, let me quote a passage from Eisenstein's later memoirs uh, about a conversation which he had with Chaplin as he was staying in California in 1930. Now, and this is how Eisenstein remembers this conversation uh, some 50 years later in his essay, Charlie the Kid, published in 1945. Uh, I quote from Eisenstein, Charlie and I are in Hollywood and going to Santa Monica. Now, as we're getting into the car, he pushes over a book to me. It is in German. Can you get a sense of what it is all about, he says. It is a German expressionist booklet, and at the end is a play dealing, of course, with a cosmic cataclysm. Charlie Chaplin pierces through the revived chaos with his stick and points the way of escape beyond the world's end, politely touching his bowler hat as he does so. I had to admit I got stuck in interpreting this post-war delirium. Can you get a sense of what it is about? is what he might have asked about much that is said about him. It is extraordinary how much metaphysical nonsense sticks to Charlie Chaplin." Uh, unquote. That was Eisenstein now. I will return to Eisenstein's verdict in a moment, but first, let me ask what this German play about Chaplin could have been. Uh, since all the, book, uh, all the books Chaplin ever had um, were lost, he left them behind in California. The only thing that remains for us is to make guesses. So like, let me make two. I made two guesses. Um, there are two German stage plays about Chaplin, uh, which could pass for an expressionist uh, drama, um, uh, each with some sort of cosmic cataclysm or another, uh, though neither of them is exactly about the end of the world. Which I uh, now, one is a tragi grotesque drama, Chaplin, by Melchior Fischer, published in Potsdam in 1924, uh, um, in the last act of which Chaplin talks to a comet that is approaching the Earth, and the comet becomes so confused that it cannot find the Earth anymore. <laughs> now, uh, the other candidate uh, is the Chaplinade, the Chaplinades, a film poem by a better known uh, author, expressionist turned Dadaist turned surrealist, Ivan Goll, French German uh, poet. Uh, it is uh, what is called a Buch drama, a play in verse, more suitable for reading than for performing. Goll's <coughs> book became known not only for its text, but also for its pictures. It came out with a series of illustrations by Fernand Leger. You recognize him, of course. Uh, it was the first time that Leger tried his hand at Chaplin's figure, uh, which, uh, which would become later a recurrent motif in Leger's art. Now, uh, there is no doomsday scene in the Chaplinian either, but there is one uh, a cosmic scale scene in which Chaplin is shown uh, is in which Chaplin is shown wandering in the desert and pulling a deer on a rope. He then sits down on a dune, uh, spreads his handkerchief and kisses the ground, Bedouin style, writes this German, Ivan Gol, and begins to dig, then he starts to dig. Uh, and down. this is how Ivan Gol describes the rest in a stage direction here. Uh, the earth opens, fantastic views, of the Earth's interior. On reaching its center, Chaplin puts a telephone receiver to his ear and listens, as at the center of a telephone system, a telephone exchange, to the voices of the entire world, <coughs> listens, uh, heard as if from a phonograph. So this is the quotation. Now, uh, 
Uh, to illustrate this scene, Fernand Leger made this drawing, and of course this is Chaplin depicted at the telephone exchange, uh, and yes, he holds a little receiver to his ear, and this exchange, remind you, lo is located in the center of the earth, um, and uh, the writings around, all around Chaplin, actually uh, come from the play itself, uh, and this is a mishmash, macaronic uh, uh, conversation in a number of languages. Uh, ten million butterflies. Elderly baker murdered. Un jour viendra. Karl the Great lived in 800. I love the lady from Zanzibar. Bitte schön, la 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 petite femme. Charlottenburg 6, brain baked in butter, etc. Now, uh, Charlottenburg is an interesting place. It will uh, <coughs> come back later, <coughs> later in the talk. <coughs> Charlottenburg is, of course, a district in Berlin. And, of course, also an obvious pun on Chaplin's French name. Now, at one point, Ivan Gold's Chaplin loses his patience and exclaims, Is that all anybody thinks of? A roaring at the center of the earth, tumult of lies, telephone stupidity, craziness of radiograms. What a poor thing, uh, what a poor thing man is. Uh, so, sounds expressionist to me. And um, so, so it may have uh, to Eisenstein, if this indeed was uh, the book which Chaplin had asked Eisenstein to interpret. Uh, but no matter whether it was this play that Eisenstein dismissed as metaphysical nonsense or another one, Chaplin could hardly expect an impartial answer, answer from Eisenstein. Back at home, Eisenstein belonged to a group which called itself Left, the left front of arts, an association of like-minded artists which combined futurist poems like poets, poets, poets like Mayakovsky, constructivist artists like Rodchenko and Stepanova, formalist scholars like Shklovsky, and radical filmmakers like Zygabertov. I'm only mentioning those who will come uh, uh, back late, later in this talk. Now, uh, these were different people with different views, but none of them, if asked, was likely to find for an expressionist version of Chaplin, a better name than nonsense. But on the other hand, plenty of nonsense about Chaplin was coming from their <coughs> own midst. Uh, dialectical nonsense, communist nonsense, and other irrelevant stuff, which I'll be trying to get a sense of in a minute. But before going to Russia, two pictures from Paris where the Chaplin craze among intellectuals began. Now, this, of course, is Fernand Leger, 1920, and this is Marc Chagall, 1929. Uh, now, let me use these two pictures to explain what I'm, I'll be looking at. Now, imagine them as two angles of a comparative triangle, the third angle of which is Charlie Chaplin, whom both pictures claim to be portraying. I'm not going to compare the artist's manners. It takes an art historian to undertake this. What I'll be looking at are those two sides of the triangle which converge on Chaplin. Uh, not to discuss resemblances and not to speculate how and why Chaplin's figure has been transformed, but rather to find out about the give and take between the artist and the model. Now, um, the dreamy Chaplin by Chagall on your right, uh, who is losing his shoe as he walks, uh, and uh, who carries his lost wing tucked under his arm may look like a regular Chagall Schlimazu. But here is a question. Was it Chagall who gave this wing to the model? Was it Chagall? Uh, or did Chagall borrow this attribute from Chaplin? Now, there were two films by that date in which Chaplin used wings. One is the kid, in which Charlie is dreaming he's an angel. And the cold rush, in which he's turned into a chicken uh, in a cannibalistic imagination of a starving prospector. Uh, and I have a fragment for you. <coughs>
So, whose wing is this? Now, uh, yes, uh, while uh, the wing on the chaplain's armpit uh, looks rather angelic, uh, not chicken like, uh, Charlie's chicken feet points to the chicken. This is not angel feet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but again, if the chicken imager, image, uh, if the chicken image uh, is, is but again, is the chicken image entirely chaplains, or Chagall had something to do with it? Now, this is not an easy thing to figure out. Now, take a look at another picture by Chagall. The gouache <laughs> painted in 1928, one year before he made his drawing of Chaplin, though after he would have seen Chaplin's gold rush. Now, uh, the name of this painting is La Poule, the chicken. This chicken has a cap and a black beard and is shown looking at the moon. Now, the reason why I'm showing uh, it is not to say that this avian Jew derives or descends from the gold rush. No, Chagall loved to paint domestic animals and to cross them with, with humans. Uh, the family tree uh, must be more complex here. Chagall's drawing of Chaplin descends from Chagall's bearded chicken crossbred with the Chaplin chicken from the gold rush. So if you were able to follow this, you will agree that Chagall's, Chagall's uh, ch ch uh, Chaplin is a freak in the second generation. Now, uh, or take Leger, whose Charlot made first look like just another of Leger's cubist affairs, an objet mécanique into which Leger used to turn anything his pen would touch. However, as we read what Leger wrote in a letter to his friend Blaise Sandrar, we come to realize that in this case, the impetus, as Leger himself uh, described it, came from Chaplin. For here it was, uh, the perfect human puppet, man the machine, exactly the kind of synthesis which he, Leger, had been looking for. So much was this artist captivated by Chaplin that he even made an attempt to animate this drawing and turn it into a film called Charlot Cubiste. Uh, pieces of it were included in Leger later film uh, Ballet Mécanique. Now, I now shift finally to uh, shift the scene uh, to Soviet Russia, where early on Leger's ideas were known and welcome. And so was his puppet like Chaplin. Early in 1922, some of Leger's Charlot drawings were reproduced in three Russian language constructivist publications, in three, uh, in the journal Object Vishch, uh, in the film journal Kinafot, and in the book on new art by Ilya Ehrenburg entitled And Yet the World Goes Rounds. As a result, even before Chaplin films reached Russia, the French worship of Chaplin was already there, taken up and adjusted to the tone and the terms then in use among the Soviet left. Uh, you almost visually experience this shift when you open Ehrenburg's book on Leger, Leger's page site, Charlot's drawing, reprinted there, and read on the opposite page what Ehrenburg has to say about Chaplin. Uh, Charlot is one of us. He's new. He's left-wing, he's a futurist. Charlot does not really, does not really rely on inspiration. He's not an intuitive comedian, but a meticulous constructor, whose movements are based on schemata as rigorous as those of a medieval juggler. Charlot's movements are funny, not because they are spontaneous, but owing to the precise formula he's using. Uh, note that the words futurist constructor and formula appear in larger fonts. These were the catchwords of the left-wing studio talk, and such was the constructivist practice of making catchwords jump off the page. Now, 
I begin my account uh, of Chaplin in Russia with another three-angled comparison, this time between A, a poem by Vladimir Mayakovsky, B, some pictures by Varvara Stepanova, and C, the up there, uh, a mysterious movie to which both the poem and the pictures seem to be pointing. Mayakovsky's poem, uh, written in 1923, named Film Crazy, is about Chaplin and the old fat Europe, and how this little tramp that now merely tickles Europe pink will soon lead the tramps of the world against her. Now, this poetic prophecy ends in an imaginary gesture. The poet reaches for a movie theater program uh, to look up the next picture of the bill. It consisted of several uh, movies, usually, um, in, in those days. And this is my translation of Mayakovsky's ending of the poem about Chaplin. Meanwhile, projectionist, show us more movies. Usher, hello, the latest attraction. This one is his newest, Charlot the Flyer, airborne Charlot. Now, let me ask the same question as I did when speaking of Charlot uh, the Chicken uh, by Chagall. Charlot the Flyer, Charlot the Krillier. Is it merely a poetic image or perhaps a reference uh, to a Chaplin movie? <coughs> the answer is not as simple as the question may suggest. Now, those who know Chaplin will say it's an image, for aside from the angel dream in The Kid, no flying stunts are found in Chaplin's silent films. And those who know Mayakovsky will agree, adding that it's a stock image for Mayakovsky, for there are other hairborne characters in Mayakovsky's poems between 1922 and 1925, which were the take-off years of Soviet civil aviation, uh, and even uh, published this book, uh, picture uh, cover by Rodchenka, uh, called A Letayushchi Proletari, Flying Proletariat. Actually, Letayushchi uh, Proletari uh, is uh, uh, an internal device, the activation of the internal form of the word, which uh, Roman Jakobson uh, used to call in those days poetic etymology. Now, all this is perfectly true. And yet, uh, evidence exists that the airborne Charlot, the airborne Charlot, uh, may not be, after all, uh, an entirely uh, Mayakovsky's invention. I will now show some pictures and then a clip from a movie. And I'll connect the pictures with the movie in an attempt to explain how it happened that the image of Chaplin and the idea of flying became apocryphally connected. Now, this connection um, clearly happened by chance. Uh, but remembering what Shklovsky said about the law of fortuity in art, now let me explore the chance factor instead of dismissing it as irrelevant as we sometimes do. Now, the pictures I'm going to look at are by constructivist artist Varvara Stepanova. Uh, they come from a series of drawings which she did for the special Chaplin issue of the constructivist magazine Kina Fart, which came up uh, out in September 1922. Now, this is Stepanova, and uh, the man whose bald head she is proudly tapping uh, is her husband Rodchenko, also a constructivist artist. Now, hanging on the wall behind them are the covers of the Kina Fart magazine, which Stepanova devi devi devised, designed, including her cover for this, for the Chaplin issue, inside which more of her Chaplin drawings are found. Uh, here are two of these. So this is a special Chaplin issue. These are drawings that she included inside the issue. Remember this, this will be important. Uh, now, mm, those familiar with the constructivist doctrine will easily tell why these little figures were called constructions, not depictions. They have texture, they are not enslaved to the page, and they do not represent Chaplin's mannerisms, but reenact them. Uh, and on the whole, they, they are akin to other geometrical humans, which Rodchenko and Sipanova used to draw and paint in the very beginning of the 20s. But again, my talk is not 
uh, to discuss my task and my talk is not to discuss Stepanova's art, but to ask about her stake in Chaplin. There are nine pictures all in all, and three of them show Chaplin as we have never seen him in his films. Here we see him grasping at a propeller, which is spinning, as indicated by two errors, uh, and the hat blown off Chaplin's hat, head. Now, the text reads, Man on a Propeller. Uh, it's the film's title, some film's title, and the whole thing looks like a sketch for a film poster. Now, um, here is another page with two more pictures, which give an idea of how he got there, how Chaplin got there. Uh, the one at the bottom, this one, the one at the bottom shows Chaplin trying to jumpstart an aircraft using the method called, in old pilot English, I looked it up, to spin the prop. Uh, while a frightened lady is shown waving her umbrella. Evidently, he succeeds, but fails to jump aside. For as the plane takes off, Chaplin becomes part of its propeller <laughs> on the right. Uh, note the fan-like shapes that indicate that Chaplin is spinning, fan-like shape. Uh, but also, they become smaller and smaller, which means, it's foreshortening, which means that he's coming right at us. Very dynamic. Uh, there are two questions I want to address here. The first one, factual one, is about the film. The other one, the hypothetical, the hypothetical one, about the interest it could have held for Stepanova and the constructivist circle she was part of. About the film, two things are clear. It is not by Chaplin, and it is not something out of Stepanova's head. The film existed and was shown in Moscow and was revived <coughs> in the theater weekly, The Spectator, uh, sorry, The Spectacle, Zrelishch, uh, by a critic who was not particularly impressed. And I quote the critic, criticism of 1922. Chaplin makes one expect a good movie, but Man on the Propeller deceives our expectations. The movie is shoddy. It claims to be about wonders of technology, but the eye of the camera mercilessly reveals them as crude props. Chaplin is brilliant, but his partners are mere extras. Their attempts to be funny pale next to the topmost acting techniques shown by this genuine eccentric, a former acro acrobat and juggler. The theme of the script is espionage, the subject characteristic of the bourgeois society. Characters' adventures arise from desperate attempts on the part of secret agencies of two rival countries to procure the secret of aviation technology. Unquote. So that was a review. But what is this movie? Now, I first thought it was made by one of Chaplin's much hated imitators. They, there was even a Russian one among the numbers, a Russian in Germany, uh, mm, Arkady Beutler, who used to make films in Germany openly challenging his famous original. This film is called Chaplin, uh, Beutler, Beutler against Chaplin. So this is written uh, in, in the at, the, at, the, at the bottom of the picture. But after having spent some time pestering slapsticks experts, um, I, thanks to one of them, which is Jennifer Bean, I finally have the title and also a general idea of how it became associated with Chaplin. It must have been the 1916 Keystone comedy Dizzy Heights and Daring Hearts, which she's, sees Chester Conklin, Chester Conklin uh, as a foreign spy eager to outdo a representative of a rival power in the acquisitions of airplanes from the United States. I have a fragment, and this is from the middle of the picture, uh, from the middle of this short. Um, earlier on, there was this is um, uh, a businessman's daughter whom this spy kidnaps and he had kidnapped her before, but she plummeted uh, on the earth using an umbrella as a parachute. And now she's trying to escape or no, 
and he's trying to kidnap her again. And doing exactly what the man on the propeller is doing. He's trapped. This is Chester Com Conklin. He's not Chaplin's imitator, this one. Uh, he has moustache, but he has walrus moustache, not the toothbrush moustache, which is famously Chaplin's. Boom! He's in, and she won uh, the duel. Uh, so he was, he was doing Chaplin stuff, he's Chaplin Chaplin stuff, but he was his own man, his own name, Chester Conklin, walrus the walrus. Now, so this Conklin film was, as we know now, advertised and reviewed in Russia as Chaplin's. Now, what must have happened is this. Chaplin's name was a rage, but his films were pricey. Besides, in 1922, not many people in Russia knew real Chaplin's face, or knew it too well, since it was only that year that the new economic policy, NEP, reopened the country's market for foreign films. So it is not hard to imagine some light-fingered importer going through distribution documents, uh, rubbing out the conch part of Conklin's name and replacing it by chap. Uh, <laughs> apparently, by the end of the summer, the secret, was, the secret was out, for this is what we read in the editorial to the Kinofot Chaplin issue, to the Kinofot Chaplin issue, signed by the Kinofot editor-in-chief, Alexei Gunn. Uh, this is the, the editorial. Here is the translation of what he writes. Chaplin's name is so big nowadays that it makes shady, shady profiteers rub their, rub their hands. Tens of so-called Chaplin films shown recently on the territory of Soviet Russia, like The Death of a Monster or Man on a Propeller, are Chaplin's films without Chaplin. It is in order to put an end to this profiteering that we dedicate this special issue of Kinofot to Charlie Chaplin, this, fir <coughs> this first and unique film comedian. Let all our comrades know, and so on and so on. I will later return to this angry editorial. Uh, yeah, now, we read this on page one of Kinofot, but no sooner kicked out of the door then this pseudo chaplain comes back through the window. Only a few pages down into the issue, we see this stubborn little movie again, looking at us from these drawings by Stepanova, uh, who, as you uh, will agree, had improved upon the original. Not only does she uh, give her hero the benefit of a frontal view, he also sh shows her Charlotte triumphantly soaring here. Soaring here, uh, whereas in the film, uh, of course, uh, the propeller adventure ended in disgrace. So now is the time to ask that second question. What could have been so special about Man on a Propeller that made Stepanova make this film her own? I know this is a speculative question, but I think it can be addressed without letting speculations take us too high. First, Stepanova was a constructivist artist, and it was much in the nature, and in the program, of course, of constructivist art to imagine the man of the future as man the machine. And here are two preparatory studies for Stepanova's Chaplin series, so we can almost see her, her brush doggedly trying to capture the moment of truth, the moment when the man turns physically into a mechanism, so on the left, he still looks like a chaplain and a man. On the right, he's already a propeller, full-fledged propeller. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a good copy also of uh, that stunt in the movie. Uh, he's <coughs> turning. Now, secondly, secondly, constructivists loved planes and used to point to light uncovered structures of early biplanes as the best inspiration for the perfect artwork. Now, these are two photographs from Ehrenburg's Constructivist Manifesto, and yet the world goes round. He reproduced them to illustrate this point from his constructivist program. I quote Ehrenburg's program. Our task is to build an art object 
that would be able to fly. Such are two rather obvious points about constructivism one can make to explain the case of Stepanova's man on, on a propeller. Now, there is also a third one, more roundabout and less obvious. To make it, I must return to the question of authenticity, so indignantly raised by the editor of Kinofot, and so lightly dismissed by Varvara Stefanova, if indeed she knew that she, if indeed she knew that what she believed was Chaplin was in fact a different man. Maybe she didn't know. Maybe the whole incident happened by an oversight. But then, that's the end of the story. And to quote that famous intertitles from Murnau's movie, Last Love, I like this strange story so much that I think it deserves a more interesting ending. So uh, let us assume, for interest's sake, that someone, let's say Alexei Gunn, uh, the editor of Kinofot who wrote this angry uh, Philippics against dishonest distributors, that he looks at the drawings, Stepanova brings the drawings to him, of course, and <coughs> says, hey, uh, didn't you know that this film is not by Chaplin? And that Stepanova answers, who cares? Now, is there a context that we can find that could be used to justify such a position? Now, the quickest way of finding this out is to take a closer look at the text inside which Stepanova's drawings are embedded. Those are pages from Kinofot's special chaplain issue. First, there is, that, there is that angry editorial I quoted. Then, there are three constructivist essays, each devoted to Chaplin. One by Stepanova's husband, Alexander Rochenko, another by Lev Kuleshov, the director, then in charge of a workshop of acting students whom Kuleshov trained according to what he declared was a new scientific method. And the third one, another one, by theater director Nikolai Fareger, then head of a futurist theater named Fareger Workshop, whose most <laughs> talked about production, Dance of Machines, came out exactly in 1922. Now, take another look at Gunn's editorial, remember? Even though Kinofot was a constructivist magazine and Gunn portrayed himself as a constructivist theorist, there is little specifically constructivist in saying that Chaplin is inimitable, that people who paid to see Chaplin are entitled to see his genuine films. Now, this is common sense. Any journalist would say so. But as we move on to those other essays, the mental picture of Chaplin that we discover grows increasingly different from guns and a far cry from anything we know about real Chaplin. So I'll address this discrepancy um, uh, 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 on a couple of pages and then return to our conundrum. Uh, the Soviet Chaplin, uh, the Chaplin portrayed by those constructivist writers, essayists, um, is a left-wing intellectual, even a scientist, also a dedicated teacher. And I must stress that this image is not fanciful, but conjectural, for the less these people knew about Chaplin, the more they modeled him upon themselves. As was typical for Soviet avant-garde groups, constructivist as a movement was, bro bo was born from theoretical debates held at an educational institution. Here it was taken for granted that artistic culture is transmittable and teachable, that ideas are as important as artworks, that new forms in art come always as a trend, that the purpose of art is not entertainment but instruction and so on. And let me repeat, even though real Chaplin would hardly buy into any of this nonsense, it is to this nons nonsense that we owe the constructivist image of Chaplin. Uh, you can tell by the way it is typeset, I'm sure, that this passage comes from Rochenko's essay. Uh, its text, text is not printed. It is designed and looks like a math equation. What it says is this. Charlie Chaplin. Master of detail, master of masses, Lenin, communism, 
and and Edison slash technique. Now this trinity, Chaplin, Lenin, and Edison, makes more sense than may at first appear. According to Rodchenka, these three men held three different keys for a better tomorrow. Edison knows about electricity, Lenin knows how to build a better society, and Chaplin knows the secret of perfect physique. I quote, why do we need him? This is what Rochenka asks and gives this answer. To teach us, half a billion of us, how to do ordinary things, the art of walking, how to wave your hand, to put on a hat. For misled as we are by the bourgeois notion of beauty, uh, we neglect the true beauty of everyday movement and gestures, their clear lines and their calculated precision. So it's a constructivist kind of cliche, death to art. Long live real life. And Luke Chaplin teaches us the beauty of real life. Now, this strange idea, the Chaplin, with his offbeat walk and his idiosyncratic gestures, is in reality an expert in the new kind of plasticity to which the future belongs, and which Chaplin teaches speech people in the enormous classroom of all film theaters in the world. Crazy as it may sound, this idea was not of Rochenko's own invention. Rather, this is a recurrent fancy in the Soviet mythology about Chaplin. I think I'm able to pinpoint its place of birth, which is, of all places, Belgium, and show how this fancy got to Russia, where it became part of the constructivist mentality. But before doing this, a few words about Foreger's and Kuleshov's essay about uh, Chaplin. Uh, Foreger's essay is about uh, Chaplin idolizers and Chaplin imitators. And it is from reading Foreger that one can imagine why Varvara Stepanova may have taken it lightly had she been told that her little propeller man was not Chaplin but someone else. Uh, its title, Charlottenburgers and Chaplinism, is this. This is the title. Now, the word Charlottenburger, as you recall, uh, as, as you can guess, I'm sure, is a trim- triple, triple pun on Charlie's first French name, on the name of the district in Berlin, and importantly, on the word Bürger, which in German and Russian means the same thing as the English and French petit bourgeois. Uh, These Charlottenburgers, according to Horeger, are idolizers, the portly European middle-class moviegoers for whom Chaplin is merely en vogue. It is for them that the yellow press concocts incredible anecdotes and stories from Chaplin's life. Uh, All these cheesy consumers want to know about Chaplin is what Chaplin eats and with whom he sleeps. This is what Farreger says about Charlottenburgers. Now, the second coined term in the title of Farreger's essay, Chaplinism, refers to Chaplin's imitators. These imitators, Farreger explains, are Chaplin's followers and students. Charlottenburger may snub and slide them, but we, the Soviets, must realize that Chaplin is not alone. He has created an army of chaplains. Nowadays, chaplinism is a school. To illustrate this point, Foreger quotes a story he came across in uh, the newspaper, it's a boulevard newspaper, uh, Paris Le Soir, Paris Le Soir. According to this newspaper, one theater proprietor announced a tournament of Chaplin's doubles. Unknown to the judges, Chaplin applied but was not admitted. Evidently, this was a canard, a morality tale about the true genius crowded out by his epigones, or something like as trite. Now, whatever the original message of this newspaper story is, there is no doubt Foreger got it correctly. But much in the spirit of the Soviet 20s, decided to turn the tables. Why did Chaplin's imitators succeed in surprising their teachers? Clearly, answers Frager, because they studied him on the screen. So they have had two teachers, Chaplin himself and cinema itself. It's technology. Now, I quote on from Frager's essay and all those things. Chaplin is an academic. 
He invents new techniques, creates the, can the canon, and launches a school. From there, the school takes over. Chaplin provides new formula, which the school develops and popularizes. American film comedy exists under the badge of Chaplinism, unquote. Apparently, in Foreger's eyes, Hollywood, um, Hollywood was not uh, an internal competitive community, as it was and still is, but a collaborative research institution, a huge workshop of sorts. Now, if we assume that Stepanova shared this illusion, it is no wonder she did not care who was the man or the propeller, Chaplin himself or a disi disciple Chaplin had trained. Uh, we do not really know if Stepanov, be if Stepanov believed in the Chaplin workshop myth, but we know that Kuleshov did. We know this from his essay in the Kinofot special issue on Chaplin, and we know this from a letter which Kuleshov wrote to Chaplin. Not many people have Chaplin's mastery of their bodies, the essay says, Kuleshov essay says. This is because Chaplin had s has studied the mechanism of his body and treats it as a mechanism. The only other actors that treat their body this way is a group of young people from the experimental workshop at State Cinema Institute, which I, Lev Kuleshov, happened to teach. So this is the gist of uh, Kuleshov's essay. Now, we study human bodies on the basis of exact calculations and s scientific experiments. And Charlie Chaplin is our first teacher, period. The essay ends. Now, how unbelievable as this may sound, uh, Kuleshov actually meant what he said. In 1924, he made an attempt to contact Chaplin by mail on behalf of his acting workshop, called it Experimentalne Kina Collective. This is not an open letter of a dear Chaplin letter, type of dear Chaplin letter of the kind Chaplin got from his fans, but a letter a scientist might have written to a colleague abroad. A methodical uh, affair, complete with sections, numbered su subsections, uh, one, section one, who we are, two, what we have achieved, three, what we want from you, and two more points elaborating on the theoretical principles. And of course, it begins with, dear sir, Milistiwe uh, The letter informs Chaplin that Kuleshov and his group has dif have, have discovered a number of laws which govern the acting on the screen. That to discover these laws, they have carefully studied Chaplin's work, that they assumed that Chaplin would be as interested in their results as they were in his. What they want from Chaplin is three things, to know more about the methods and what he thinks about theirs. Would cultural filmmakers in America be interested in establishing an ideological link with us? This was a direct quote. And lastly, Kulishov and his students want Chaplin to send them a bibliography of printed work which he thinks might be relevant to their further research. Now, uh, as to their own bibliographical appendix, the main uh, item on it was this 1922 article entitled The Kino Institute, in which the principles of Kuleshov's workshop are laid out by Alexei Gunn and illustrated by one of workshop students, Pyotr Galajev. Uh, from this essay, Chaplin would learn that during the experiments, students were instructed to think of themselves as mechanisms, not humans, and indeed, in the etude called Destiny, Sujba, uh, student Khochlova and student Pudovkin look like two robots involved in a family uh, quarrel, that for every ordinary gesture, there is one and only one right way of performing it, and see student Komarov the, here, here he is. Um, he is um, demonstrating in an etude called the phone talk, the right way to lift the receiver and put it to your ear. That to train your body to perform actual movements, actual movements, uh, which is what student uh, Hochlova uh, is demonstrating here, upper hands. Um, uh, um, a special mechanism, contraption, contraption was used, made of a plank, a rope, and a pole. Now imagine Chaplin and his face, if he indeed received all this by mail. 
Now, uh, why was Kuleshov so sure that Chaplin was as much in love with science as he himself was? The one source of it was a Belgian literary rumor. I'll say a couple of words about it in a moment. Uh, to get to it, though, I need to explain something about Kuleshov's workshop. The ideas, methods, and equipment they used were not exactly their own. Many of them Kuleshov borrowed from the work done at another research institution, the State Institute of Labor in Moscow, built to adapt to Soviet conditions the labor efficiency method developed by the American uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Say it's Taylorism. Taylorism. Now, the Labor Institute was geared to study human locomotion, and this was something Kuleshov uh, uh, workshop used too. So this is uh, one of the labs, uh, one of the labs in this um, labor institute, <coughs> uh, labor institute led by Gustav. And what you can see here is, yes, uh, a worker, a kind of a guinea pig worker, hammering something. Uh, and uh, uh, here is a photographer or chronophotographer making uh, pictures, photographic pictures of his continuous movement. And uh, here is uh, a psychologist that looks at it and look at those uh, careful models, uh, plywood uh, or metal uh, used to model and schematize those things. So pretty serious stuff. And they published uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, this would be a result of this chronophotographic. And they uh, trace the movement, they trace the movement in light. And those things were called cyclograms. And this is the cyclogram of hammering. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the ultimate goal, uh, of course, was not only raising the efficiency level at Soviet factor, uh, factory. There was an ideological goal as well, um, it's formulated by, by, uh, by Trotsky, uh, who, uh, who, s who said, our goal is to raise the new <coughs> social... Um, is it time to, f to, to end? No. We need a couple of minutes more. Uh, OK. Uh, Trotsky said, this is part of our program of creating the new socio-biological being. So Taylorism was seen in the Soviet Union as the Soviet answer to eugenics, a theory of human race improvement, race improvement by means of selection, which was at that time popular in the West. And this is Soviet eugenics. We happen to uh, have a, a documentary footage of what is happening by bringing up, by training, a new social biological being in the Institute of Labor. And once again, I'm showing this not as a parallel, but as a source for Kuleshov's experiments. For Kuleshov frequented the Institute of Labor, trying to borrow what he could to educate actors how to behave in films and on stage. And once again, he used uh, the gears and the equipment that they used. Now the question is, what on earth has all this to do with Chaplin? Now, uh, uh, more than an outside observer might suspect. Now, take a look at the essay, The Taylorized Gesture, by one Ippolit Sokolov, a self-proclaimed art theorist who did not belong to the core of the less left-wing theater movement, but rather to its lunatic fringe. Uh, this Sokolov used to take up the ideas implicit in the work of people like Kuleshov and Meyerhold and drive them to their logical extreme. Now, this essay is a case in point. As the Taylorist Institute of Labor trains workers to move rationally at the working places, the essay says, so must the theater. 
teach ordinary people move correctly in ordinary life. Illogical, indecisive, curved, or rounded gesture must be banned from the future socialist state. The straight line plus the acute angle will be the staple of the new style, which Shok Sokolov called the style of Russian Socialist Federation. Still a recipe, sir. Now, uh, it is in order to transmit this new style from the stage to, uh, to the street, from the stage to the street, that Taylorist tools must be used in actors' training, Sokolov claims in this essay. Like this grid covering the walls and the floors in exercise rooms. So we know that Kulishov workshop used uh, such like grids. Now, uh, again, his essay also makes an obscure reference to a mysterious foreign professor, Lo Shar Lo Shi, uh, ostensibly known for his methods of teaching everyday movements by making his pupils imitate operations performed by machines constructed for this special purpose. Now, uh, here comes the chase. This foreign professor, Loshar Loshi was not of Sokolov's invention. Loshar Loshi is a literary character invented in 1920s by Belgian author Franz Hellens for his novel Melusine, whose imagery uh, literary historians of our days have labeled pre-surrealist. In its chapter entitled Our Teachers, Our Teachers, Machines, Helen makes the reader enter a vast corridor of sorts with various mechanisms aligned along its walls, while people grouped in front of them are trying to imitate the motions of their mechanical parts, the people imitating machines, specially built machines. We also encounter the inventor of this method, Professor Lachar Lachy, whose profound philosophy and faultless mastery of his body contrasts with his funny looks and enormous boots. It took no trouble for critics to crack the professor's name and find out who is hiding inside the word. This is Charlot, of course. Uh, now, this is how Helen's funny wizard explains what he does. I translate. Uh, I have studied people. The mistake all people make is that they do not understand what the true movement is. Nature is a good teacher, but nature is erratic and prone to whims. Only mechanisms can discipline nature. Gods are dead. Our, teacher, our teachers are our own creations, the machines. Now, Franz Helen's novel was never translated into Russian, nor was it in, into English, as far as I know. Now, Russian readers learned about Professor Lashar Lashi via Helen's essay, Literature and Cinema, published in 1922 in the constructivist magazine Object. As this essay explains, the superhuman precision and control that distinguishes Chaplin's films, especially The Kid, inspire the same kind of respect for their makers as one feels towards the builders of aircrafts and cars. Now, the reason for this is, and I quote here, that no artwork of our days comes close to the blinding clarity of this film's internal mechanism. In my recent novel, Mel Melusine, Helen says, I turned Chaplin into a scientist, a weird and wonderful genius of dynamics, whose movements, four movement schools, installed in four parts of Europe, uh, herald the new ethics of social movement, and so on. He goes on explaining uh, his own imagery. You can imagine the kind of resonance a talk like this, talk like this, uh, must have caused in the poor mind of a young proselyte like Sokolov. But of course, as we know, some stronger minds uh, did too, did not remain unaffected. Now, time has come to round up my story about the relationship between Chaplin and the Soviets. What I think makes this relationship interesting and worth looking at is that it is not just between Chaplin and whoever takes a pen and writes about Chaplin, takes a pencil and draws up his picture. There's always a triangle, a third 
force that interferes. Leninism, Taylorism, Thomas Edison, or Chester Conklin, something utterly irrelevant, which makes this relationship similar to a keystone comedy, a comedy of mistakes or a co comedy of mystification. This brings me back to the phrase I used for the title of this talk, The Laws of Fortuity in Art. As I mentioned, it comes from a book written in 1926 by Viktor Shklovsky. As I said, Shklovsky used this phrase polemically. It was pointed against the old school scholars mostly interested in regularities and laws, religious laws, political laws, societal laws, or the laws of the sublime, which they believed were manifested in works of art. Now, the scholar of formalist school, the formalist school, Shklovsky had little patience for such like laws. The only laws the student of art and literature must be mindful of are the laws of fortuity, he said. For it is, for there is only one thing that artists know better than anyone else is to how to make use of chance and how to make sense of nonsense. Now, if we look at, uh, at the story I told about Chaplin and his Russian avant-garde uh, shadow, we should admit Shklovsky had a point. Take the connection we discussed earlier on between Chaplin's chicken and the chicken painted by Chagall. Each of the two chickens belong to a separate, autonomous world. Chaplin's chicken stems from the world of British stage buffoonery and <laughs> aided by the Hollywood special effects. Now, in his turn, Chagall's chicken belongs to the Paris school in painting, coupled with the Russian-Jewish thematic material. A Jewish chicken looking at the Russian church is a complex cultural image. Chaplin's chicken is a slapstick gag. Chagall's chicken was born in the head of a French painter. Chaplin's chicken in the head of a hungry poultry lover. Not even a die-hard cultural theorist will venture to say that there is more than coincidence in the encounter we witness here. But here's why we should not dismiss such coincidences. Today we realize this, of course, but uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, today we realize that this, of course, but was but a chance encounter. But can we be sure that Marc Chagall realized this as well? Apparently, he did not, for when in 1923, after several years of absence, Chaplin, Chagall, sorry, Chagall returned from Russia to Paris, uh, this is what he said in his very first interview to the magazine L'Art Vivant. I quote Chagall, Europe has changed. I was glad to discover that expressionism has triumphed in Germany. I am excited about the birth of surrealism in France and about the presence of Chaplin on the screen. Today, Chaplin is perhaps the only artist with whom I could find a common language. This was, was Chagall. Chagall wrote about Chaplin, and then he created those series of drawings of Chaplin, and he communicated, he was in dialogue with Chaplin's imagery, uh, because, of course, he misread it as his own, or relative his, to, him, to, to his. And uh, in this, it seems, Chagall was not alone. Misled by the laws of fortuity in art, Ivan Gol mistook Chaplin for a poet, Stepanova for a constructivist, and Fernand Leger for a cubist. So the last picture I want to show today is a collage by Leger entitled Charlot Cubist. Charlot is a cubist in the cubist eyes. Uh, every famous beauty in the world, from the armless Venus to Leonardo Mona Lisa, are in love with Chaplin, uh, the cubist. This is what the picture says. Mona Lisa even decides to kill herself for him. But as a true cubist, Charlot could not care less about the life or death of figurative art. Now, the inscription below says, Charlot goes away. Charlot does not care. Charlot s'en fout. In the bottom corner of the right, under Charlot's and uh, 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 the uh, Leger signature, is the Leger signature. Uh, uh, we have a, a rebus of sorts, or a verbal visual pun. This is a train, and uh, the last 
words of the drawing, the final words of the drawing, says, as we were, to be continued. So I think that it's a good place to discontinue the talk.